Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I'm excited to be here with Evan Price of Artist Collective. We're going to be talking about how to make money as a musician and creative, which, of course, that is pretty much the goal of this podcast. So I'm excited to be talking to Evan today and, and dig into all of his great ideas and how he helps his clients. But first, I would love to have you share, Evan, your background, kind of your story leading up to where you are today as far as um, your journey in music and then how you kind of started working with clients as you do today. Sure. Yeah. Uh, first of all, appreciate you having me. Um, I got started like a lot of people do, especially in the coaching world. You know, I was a musician myself. Um, I found myself just really wanting to create music with my friends when I was about 14, got into, got into a couple bands, ended up booking myself and, and our bands and just realized I, I really like the business side. I remember being like in this minivan with six of my friends, like, Oh, is this what I want to do forever? Um, and I like was doing the, the promoter, putting on the promoter hat and talking with the, um, with the other promoters and like, okay, here's, here's your guarantee. Here's this. And I was just like, man, I really just like, like this side of things for some reason. So I was really attracted to more of the entrepreneurship that comes from being a, you know, independent musician over the, you know, the touring and, uh, you know, having to deal with all of that stuff. So I ended up going to music business school, got a degree and opened my own company to help other artists or artistpreneurs, as I call them, find out how to make money doing what they love, whatever that means. That's awesome. So you specifically went to school for music business. Correct. Okay. And so your school they weren't focused on like improving your musical skills. It was all about the entrepreneurship side. Yeah. I'll be honest with you, you know, back when was that 2010, 2011, um, it was hard to find a school like that. I was going to say like, where is this magical school? Because most of the time it's like everyone's focused on your musical skills, which is great, but then you don't mm -hmm. learn the business stuff. Yeah. I remember going to a bunch of the state schools. So I'm here in Illinois. Um, I go to a bunch of the state schools, look around and I'm like, cool. So this is what I want to do. So they're like, well, we can give you, you, you can go into music class and then you can also go into business class. I'm like, well, that's not really the same thing. I'm going to keep it. really up. isn't because that's exactly what I did. I have a dual degree in music uh, and business, but they were yeah. very much totally separate things. Yeah. Yeah, I went to um, Columbia here in Chicago. So it's like a liberal arts school. And they did specifically have a music business program, which was really cool. So I jumped on it, got accepted, um, went here for a couple of years. And yeah, found out that I really, really enjoyed this side of things. That is so good to hear because I also went to a liberal arts school, but they did not mm. have such a program. And I mean, yeah. I, don't, I still don't think they do. You know, I went to school in the 90s, but I still don't think they have that kind of a program. They're focused. They have more of a conservatory model, you know. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you're very lucky to have gotten that because for me, it was actually hard to apply what I learned in business and entrepreneurship to music because music is such a different kind of business, you know, and I kind of thought in the back of my mind, well, these are two totally different things. I'm doing the business degree as like a fallback plan, you know, and I did, I worked as an accountant and a manager and stuff like that. And of course it's helped me a lot in my, you know, business now and marketing, but I did not understand how to join those two together. Do you do you think that that's, you know, a problem for a lot of people? Yeah, I think so. It's that it's the two sides of your brain, right? Mm -hmm. It's you that creative side and then the business side. It is really hard to 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 meld those, especially cuz a lot of creatives just like do it for the love of it and mm -hmm. they a lot of times feel like asking for money or focusing on money kind of taints that experience. 
Um, but if you truly want to do it as a career, you, you've got to have the business side of it. Like, cool. If you want to do it as a hobby, like that's great, but you need to find ways to make money from it. And you have to kind of put on that entrepreneur hat. Yeah. And I even say like, Hey, if you're going to do it for a hobby and you want to do it for a long term, you also need to understand the business side. Cause if you don't make any money, that is an expensive hobby and it's going to be, you know, draining your money. If you want to keep recording and stuff like that and buying mm -hmm. instruments and you know what it is, right? Like all the gear mm -hmm. and, and just the cost of recording. And even if you're able to record from home, you have to, buy the gear and everything like that. And a lot of times you've got to hire people to help you with arrangements, unless you know how to play every instrument, you know? So I feel like no matter what you need to learn the business side. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just one of those things that, I mean, you don't have to go to music business school like I did to learn that. I, I was in it and I really enjoyed my experience. I met a lot of cool people. I think the connections I made is was more than the the knowledge I gained, if I if I can be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but they just gave me some books that I could have just you know bought on Amazon and read. <laughs> if I'm being true, be honest. So Man, it's like, yeah. <laughs> well, that's actually good to know because it's like you don't have to spend all that money to get the knowledge that you need. You know, you get some books. You um, you know you work with people like you and I, uh, you and me, and that's all you need. You don't need to go get a fancy degree. Yeah. And I mean, what I experienced in college is just like, I think this is goes, it goes to say towards any, I think, degree or like focus, but our industry moves so quickly mm. that it was changing as I was there. Like the four major labels turned to three major labels, Spotify exist, started to exist. So our professors were talking about almost outdated ideas yes while I was in the class. So that was a little frustrating. And that's what really steered me towards like what I do now, which is more online teaching, coaching, because we can move just as quick as, you know, the industry does. Oh, cool. AI is a thing. How do we use that into our, into our mix instead of it going through the whole college and then getting it approved. And then by the time they approve it, things have changed again. That's what I experienced at least. Oh, it's so true. I mean, I just interviewed Ari Herstand about his, the new version of his book, um, the new, how to make it in the new music business. And like so much has changed just in three years since he did his last version of the book. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy that that book is getting into colleges and universities because at least it's a way to keep them somewhat updated. But it probably still is kind of behind, you know, because as soon as he doesn't write a book of another version of it for three years, probably a lot has changed. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, OK, so let's talk about, you know, how can you prioritize income? as a musician in kind of, you know, if you're actually creating a business plan, or at least you just have kind of a, a trajectory of what you're trying to do to build a music career, how can you prioritize making income? Yeah, I think what I like to focus our clients on is figuring out what is it that you do that you could sell at a high ticket, because you don't have, if you start there, you only have to sell a couple of those mm. to at least make your bottom line, right? Whatever that means for you. Like if it's a studio or it's like a custom song or selling and flipping gear or coaching others how to do something that you've already done, start there and then kind of build out instead of going towards the shotgun approach, as I call it, which is trying to find a bunch of fans that pay you $3 a month, for instance. Um, it's just easier to get by if you can if you can really craft a high ticket offer around what you're already doing, what you already love to do. So I would always say prioritize that first, then you can kind of, you know, go through that value ladder, as they call it. Um, cool. What's what? What else can I do that I need a lot of people to pay for? Whether it's a Patreon or a, a small merch piece of merch or streams, for instance, like that'll come. But how can you pay your bills first and foremost? So something package your something around a high ticket offer. It's always a focus. Yeah. So I think that's good because a lot of musicians start out with those things you just mentioned. You know, streams and Patreon. And things that feel like less intimidating and they and they're more natural and they don't, you know, they don't have to like think hard and package things up and really know how to do the marketing. Um, but that will probably cause them to struggle for a very long time because those things are not very high paying. 
Yeah. And you, when you look at cool to get a massive amount, what, what is it? 4,000 streams pay you like a thousand bucks or a million streams is 4,000 bucks. That's what it is. And it's like to get that million, you have to pay so much in like ads and getting it out there just to not even not even meet your bottom line. So you're going to burn out with something like that. At first you can kind of bootstrap it in other ways. You won't be as, as broke. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Is there a way to do a high ticket offer for performing? Cause let's just say that a musician, you know, maybe they don't feel super confident in their ability to teach something or coach people on something but they are an amazing performer. Is there is there something they can do in that realm that's a little more high ticket? Absolutely. Great question. Um, corporate gigs, weddings, private parties. You'd be surprised, especially in the corporate realm, like corporations have a budget they need to spend and they need cool entertainment for holiday parties, for, you know, you know, random parties that they that they throw for team building exercises and whatnot. They are actively looking for cool performers and they'll pay you $5,000 for the same show you would have played for free or for exposure. <laughs> you know what I mean? So getting into those circles is definitely more beneficial than even those ticketed events. You know, they, they both play a good part, but weddings too, like weddings are crazy. You don't even need a full band to really get into that. So um, I think those are good, fruitful activities if you are a performer and you don't want to just coach, for, for instance. And what's the best way, like, how do you recommend that they, quote, package that up in a way that's appealing to those kind of people, corporations or weddings versus just saying like, hey, I'm a musician, want me to play? Right. Also a good question. I think this go, this is true for like any high ticket offer. It's all about the transformation that you're selling. What is the emotion that you're selling? You're not selling you performing at the show, you're selling the emotions you're going to create while you're playing that. So if you can package that and communicate that in a good way to whoever is booking, like, Hey, I'm going to bring your boring party to life. For instance, I'm going to make sure everybody's having a good time. You can really showcase that on your website with lots of content that showcases those things happening. It's you're able to kind of put it at a high ticket instead of just being like, Hey, I'm a singer and I sing like, yeah, you could pay me to sing. Like that's not that appealing. So if you can really paint that transformation, uh, whatever that might be, you can sell it for a thousand plus for the same gig. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, I combined like stories and songs, you know, so I really build myself more as a speaker who Mm. includes music. And, you know, with a particular program that had a particular theme and focus and and would make, you know, would bring, make them feel a certain way inspirationally. And that was really where I started to like, suddenly I could start charging a lot more. You yeah. Know? Or even in, in, in your realm too, like house shows, I think, mm-hmm. of course, COVID changed things for that. But before that, I knew tons of artists that aren't huge at all, but making over six figures, just playing private house shows for their super fans and not even charging anything and just saying, Hey, tip me whatever you want. They're making, they're, they're making multiple thousand dollars a show because they're able to create that experience and bring them into, to, to their world of, of storytelling. So that's another piece too. I think house shows are, are a cool thing that are coming back. Absolutely. Um, I definitely think they're coming back. I'm planning on having one in my backyard. Um, assuming it doesn't rain, I figure I can just do it in my garage if it rains, but you know, like there are ways to do it besides, Mm -hmm. you know, what we used to do before COVID, you know, maybe people are a little more reticent now, uh, because of COVID to have it inside, but you can still absolutely have it outside. And what's great about those two, like number one, I totally agree with doing the, the donation model, because I think a lot of times people will give more that way than if it's ticketed. But also, you know, you kind of got this captive audience for your merch and people are there. They had a great experience. They're going to want to take that home with them. Yeah, I've even seen that model of like pay what you want work really well for merch. And I don't know that can be tricky. A lot of artists are like, I don't know. People may just take. Honestly, you're going to. I've seen people make more like, hey, I have a CD here. Leave what you want. 
more often than not, they're leaving 20 instead of the five you were going to ask. So, yeah. yeah, I think that works for CDs because as we know, like it's hard to sell those anyway, but yeah. you know, I'm not sure I would do it for things where we had to outlay a certain amount, you know, t-shirts and stuff like that. But huh. yeah, totally. That's, I think sometimes people just want to support you, but there's not a really easy way for them to like, especially if it's an event where there isn't an option to donate in any way. Uh, other than through March, that is a great way to do it. Cause I've had people like walk up to me and they're like, I just want to support you and hand me a hundred dollar bill, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but that doesn't happen very often. But if you give them a way to donate, they, they can do that. Yeah. And I mean, Ari even says this too, like if you're in those rooms, even if it is a ticketed, a low ticketed event or a private party, like it is your job as the performer to connect with everybody, like mm -hmm. go up and talk to them, grab their email, try to get them on your list, give them a sticker, like have those conversations. You're going to build relationships that way, which could turn into other private parties. I think I see performers, if we're talking about performers in, in particular, just kind of treat it like a show. Like I'm just going to play and then I'm going to leave. Like you're missing out on opportunities by not going up to every single person in that room that even looked at you for a quick second, like say hello, tell them who you are, give them your card. Like I think that personal aspect is forgotten a lot with performers. Like that's needed. It, it is. A lot of people are super uncomfortable with that though. So, I mean, you know, it's, it, yeah. it's a skill it's, and you gotta, yes. you gotta start doing it and feel super uncomfortable about it first. And then you'll feel more comfortable. But I, most artists I know are very uncomfortable about just walking up to people and introducing themselves. Yeah, you're right. It is a skill. And I think that's a skill, uh, just like all the business things we're talking about that mm -hmm. you have to focus on. You can't just pick up a guitar and hope it works out anymore. You've got to really hone these skills that we're talking about. Yeah, totally. Okay, well, so let's talk about um, as far as high ticket offers for example, somebody who has got a a studio of some kind where they're teaching already, like they're teaching piano or they're teaching voice, how can they expand that? Because of course they're they're trading time for money. How can they expand that into something where they're making a lot more with it? Sure, um, kind of a similar answer to the the high ticket events, which is you are selling the transformation. You're not selling your time. You're not selling, oh, it's $40 a lesson. Because what I hear a lot from um, vocal coaches and songwriting coaches or guitar coaches, drum coaches, whatever, is they're not, they're, they seem to be attracting people who aren't as serious about that transformation. There's like, yeah, I'll take a couple lessons and I'll soak mm -hmm. it up. They're not really going to, are you really going to learn drums in two lessons? Like probably not. So if you can package it into, Hey, I'm going to specifically help you go from um, being unconfident, even singing in front of your family to being so confident you sing in front of a state on a stage of a thousand people. That's a transformation that you can sell more powerfully at a thousand dollars plus for an eight week program. Instead of that hourly lesson model, you're going to attract people that are more serious because they paid a thousand dollars up front there. You better believe they're going to be dialed in and you're selling more of a, Hey, here's a promise. I'm going to promise you by the end of this, you're going to get this big, this big thing that you want. So just dialing in on the exact things you help people with, instead of just offering lessons, you are helping them change, make change in their life. So I'm curious, cause you know, I've, I've helped people do this as well. And one thing that really stresses them out is, well, can I really promise this transformation? Like it's, I can only do so much. I can't make them do it. So what do you, what do you say to that? Yeah. I mean, that goes to any coaching, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't put in the work, I always use this analogy of like a personal trainer. That's mm -hmm. what I consider myself. I'm a personal trainer for your, for your music business, for your, for your artist business. If you don't pick up the weights or get on the treadmill or go to the gym or, or eat the diet that I'm telling you to eat, you're not going to get the results, but it comes down to, do you have a track record of that happening? If someone did do it, so that's first. So if they are feeling like, oh, I don't feel confident enough that I can get that transformation, you probably just need to do it more and make that happen. For instance, it's typically best to do that if you've yourself gone through that transformation. If you said, hey, I did the things I'm teaching, 
and I got this transformation, I know it'll work for you and other people. Then you get one more person to do it. Cool. There's another piece of social proof. There's three more people that have done it. Great. Now you can feel confident like, hey, if you go through these steps, you will get the thing that I'm promising. And that's when you can add on like guarantees. Hey, if you do this, if you do everything I say and we can like document it and you don't get the results, I'll give you your money back. That's a huge promise. So I think building those those reps and like getting that social proof under your belt is important. Can't make claims like that and not actually have them come true. Definitely not preach and fake it till you make it. You need to get those those actual numbers and the actual results first. But in the end, you're right. You can't make them do the things, but making that clear up front, I think is important. Like, hey, if you don't show up to, to class or, or do the things that I'm saying, you're never going to get this transformation and nobody's going to be able to help you. So I think making that clear is important. Yeah, but I do think that people are really uncomfortable to make what you that kind of promise like you just said, where like, if you don't get these results, I'll give you your money back or I'll keep working with you until you do. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you make artists feel a little more comfortable with offering that kind of guarantee, especially when it's, you know, they don't have a ton of results yet, or they haven't, they don't feel like so confident that they can get this result for anyone. Yeah. I think the lowest barrier is, that was a great point of I'll keep working with you. It's like, cool. You're not out money at that point. You're just Mm -hmm. out a little bit more time to make sure that they are setting those stipulations. Like I'll work with you for another two months. That's a, that's a low barrier promise that I think a lot of our clients have no problem doing, but if they do feel uncomfortable with that, I would say, cool, go out and get more results then go Mm -hmm. out. And before you offer that money back guarantee or whatever, make sure that your system actually works because we want it to work. If if it doesn't work, you're not going to sell any of it and nobody gets helped. So um, I think just putting in those reps and just working with more people and dialing in the process will bring up that confidence to be able to offer a guarantee like that. Yeah, yeah, totally. So what if you are a songwriter? So like maybe there, someone's listening to this or watching this and thinking, like, I don't teach voice. I don't, you know, teach production. I don't, you know they could probably do the performing thing, but maybe they don't want to because they don't want to tour or whatever, but they do write music. How can, how can they feel confident to be able to teach other people songwriting if, you know, they haven't done that before? Yeah. I mean, I'll preface that with saying not everybody is built to be a coach and that's okay. Um, I, I think that's, that that's worth mentioning. Like, sometimes you just, you have a process, but unless you really have a passion for helping others do that, maybe coaching isn't the, I guess the focus for you. I think to build that confidence is just kind of what I said before, like putting in those reps and being able to do it for yourself. If you can look back and say, Hey, I've written a thousand songs. Maybe they didn't go anywhere, but I've been able to do this thing that other people are desperate for, which is being able to finally finish songs. That's what I hear a lot of our songwriting coaches is like all of their clients are like, I, you know, this is the phrasing their clients always use. Like I have a bunch of song ideas in my voice memos, but I don't know how to finish them. I don't have the confidence to push through. So maybe you're just good at being able to take away that overthinking part of your brain and finish those songs. And you can probably push other people through that. So again, that's the transformation that they honed in. I'm, I'm going to help you take, by the end of this eight weeks, I'm going to help you take your voice memo ideas and turn them into finished song demos. You know what I mean? So it's just about like honing in on what you've been able to perfect for yourself a lot of times. Um, and you can probably help others if you have a passion for doing that. I think that's a really good angle because I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people out there are like, yeah, I've written a lot of songs, but I haven't written any hit songs. So how could I, you know, say that I'm going to be a songwriting coach? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the, you know, the imposter syndrome creeping in. Maybe your hit song you wrote just didn't get heard by the right people. Maybe it just didn't get in the hands of of other people. So maybe if you were to help somebody else write a song, maybe that would turn into a hit song. It's just about writing more songs. I think, again, that's a skill. I think a lot of people, a lot of up and aspiring songwriters want, maybe they just never even finished a full song. There's like, I have a bunch of lyrics written down. I know that I want to do this, but I'm not sure how to get started. 
they don't necessarily need or look or are out here looking for Grammy winners to help them. They probably can't afford that, but they just need an accountability person, right? That's it when it comes down to it. That's cool. I think I think that helps a lot of people out there feel like I I, I do have at least I do have the the skill of finishing or I have the skill of time management or whatever it is that you know someone else out there doesn't have, but they're like supremely talented in their writing, but they just can't get it done. You know, yeah. so I think that that's a really good good angle on how how they can do that, how they can build a, a program out of it. So what do you say as far as like coaching, like one on one group of, uh, you know, course membership? Like, do you how do you guide people in which one of those things is right for them to offer? Sure. I have an interesting relationship with course builders, and that's what I hear a lot from our um, potential clients and clients like, I, you know, I have an idea. I want to build a course. I want to just put it online and have passive income coming in. Wouldn't we <laughs> all? Here. It doesn't <laughs> yeah. work like that. Yeah. I mean, Hey, I was, I was doing that years ago as well. I thought that was the move, but here's the thing. One, it's harder for you know, unless you have a gigantic following or just a huge track record of being able, having that course that you build actually be able to get results. It's hard to get, it's hard to, push people into action, especially if it's a low ticket thing. Mm -hmm. How many of us have books that we bought that are just sitting on the shelf that we just like maybe read the back cover. If I would have spent $1,200 on that book, I probably would have read it. Right. That's why one-on-one -on -one high ticket, I think is more impactful first do that work with people one-on-one -on -one, then maybe slip into group coaching then maybe you know see what the what the track record is what the social proof is and be like okay this is really working let's put that into a course and say i can say hey you know i've had a hundred people go through this with me one-on-one -on -one and gotten the results i'm promising all you need to do is go through and take the steps without even talking to me and you can get those results so that's why i always say start with the high ticket one-on-one -on -one first go to group, then decide if that coaching, or I'm sorry, the course passive income thing is the next best step for you. But starting there, I've never really seen that work really well. Not that it hasn't somewhere out there, uh, but without that big following or, or that track record, it, it's just hard to get people, you know, off the couch and, and doing the things in the course, even if it's really, really solid information. Yeah, I generally agree with that. I mean, you can do a hybrid model where you have mm -hmm. like a course and then you have maybe like a one group call a month or something like that. Um, and that can be appealing because they know at least they're going to get that real time support if they're going through the course and they're just not either making progress, they're not understanding something or they just need that accountability to keep going. So I think that can be really useful. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, but, but probably not until you get to the point of group, right? You got to do the one-on-one -on -one first to know that you've, you can get the success for people. And also it helps you kind of hone your, your, uh, method, your methodology, right? So you can then package it into a course. You, you know, I've worked with this many people and on average, these are the things that worked best, you know, and then you can package it up into a, a course. And, and in that way, then Maybe even you can use that with your one-on-ones and not have to spend so much time explaining the same thing over and over to them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, that hybrid approach you're talking about it is definitely a good um, compromise because people just need that accountability, right? Again, use that analogy. Going to go to the gym, pay $20, go in there. You may not show up. Even if you had a model where every once every week there was a personal trainer there waiting for you, somebody's expecting you, they're, he's gonna, they're gonna show you what to do, you're gonna be a lot more tapped in and you're probably gonna get a lot better results than the person who just had the, you know, the basic gym membership. Same thing here. So you need some kind of accountability to help push you over those roadblocks is really crucial. So not totally against courses, but I'm totally against courses before you've even done any of these other models. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Do you find that anybody says to you, well, I feel like I need to get some kind of a certification before I start coaching people? Do I ever get people that that, are, that is asking that? Is that you? Is yeah, because I've experienced that with people like, oh, I don't feel like I can actually put myself out there as a coach until I get some kind of coaching certification. All comes down to results. Mm. Nobody has ever outside of interviews like this. Nobody's ever asked me if I have a degree. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? I got a piece of paper, you know, collecting dust in here. Um, they just see that I've that I have other results that 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 they want. That's all. They've never been like, well, how are you certified? I've never had that question. So it all comes down to results. That's more important than the certification. If you feel like you're not a you know a good coach and you can't you know activate people or hold them accountable, then yeah, maybe you should go and take some kind of a leadership course or some kind of thing that gets you a certification. I don't, I know Brendan Burchard has like a, a, is this, this like high performers coaching program that people go through, but I don't think it's necessary if you can actually get the results you're promising. That's, that's key. I agree. I agree. But I I have experienced a lot of people saying like, oh, I feel like I need to have this on my website for people to take me seriously as a coach. You know what I mean? But I, I agree. If you, if you've got the testimonials, you don't need that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what about the tech side? This is where I work with a lot of, you know, I'd say older artists that are very uncomfortable with the tech and they're like, well, I'd love to sell something online, but I have no idea how to set this up so people can buy from me. And that just completely like paralyzes them in moving forward. Yeah, I can definitely. I mean, I've got clients that are not older that experience that same thing. If that makes <laughs> anybody out there feel better, you know what I mean? Um, it's just like what, like what we said for a lot of these other things. Like it's a skill that can be learned. If you are serious about this, you got to put it in those reps and learn it. Um, and that's why I think that the coaching really helps. Like having somebody there to walk you through it, even to send a quick like um, screen share video, like here, here's how you set up the Facebook ads real fast really helps you work through those roadblocks. And what I've seen more often than not is most of the stuff artists and musicians and um, people wanting to get into this realm deal with is like half of the stuff you think is important when it comes to tech actually isn't. Mm. So I think it's a skill in itself knowing what to just forget about and what to actually hyper-focus on. Like, do you need a full blown out website um, with all the bells and whistles code, you know, coded and everything? No, honestly, you do need a, some kind of a digital presence, um, presence, I think, some kind of real estate online to, to point back to, but does it need to be this fancy thing you learn how to code or spend $5,000 having someone else do? I don't think so. Um, so knowing when to put things down and knowing when to like focus on things, I think is a skill in itself. So, you know, in the end, if you're, if you're struggling with the tech, find somebody who isn't struggling with the tech who can walk you through that. So maybe that's a coach, maybe that's just a friend or a mentor, but having someone to lean on, I think it will help through that. What do you recommend as like the easiest? Cause if you're doing one-on-one really all you need is like an online presence and a way for people to pay you, <laughs> you know? So what do you recommend for people like that just to get started? Zoom and PayPal. Yeah. That's it. Done. <laughs> that's, re- that's really it. I mean, even like, you know, landing pages when we first started, like I had a, a page, I had one landing page and it had like a couple testimonials and a, a way to book a call with, with us. Mm. That's really it. So, you know, sim- um, simplicity is better, I think, when getting started. And I think that's the beauty of online coaching is you don't need all these things. You don't need all of these like backend systems right at the beginning. You just need, a, like you said, a strong methodology to help get results, a way for them to pay you and a way for them to meet with you every week. That's it. Right. You don't need a big funnel. You don't need order bumps and and upsells and all that stuff yet. Right. Yes. Build that as you go. Absolutely. But what, just to get started, you don't need all that. And I think that's a big struggle for specifically creatives, right? We're, we're, we're all in our heads. We're like, oh, I want it to look pretty. I want it to look manageable. And in the end, they end up making all that, making this fancy course that they're hoping that just gets money in their pockets while they sleep. And yet they find out that their methodology, like you said, isn't that strong. So they did put all of this work and energy into making it look good when it actually isn't like working in itself. So focusing on that first, keeping it simple is all you really need. Cool. And do you recommend like in order to get a client um, that you really need to meet with them, like for just an initial consult, or do you find that people are willing to just sign up for this stuff just by like reading the marketing materials? Mm, yeah, um, I am a strong believer in discovery strategy calls. 
let's make sure, especially if it's high ticket, like, cool. If, if you have a $20 course, if you're down the path, like we talked about, you're ready to do the course. You can sell a course and run an ad and have people go straight to that, go to an order bump, things like that. If you're selling, you know, a 12 week program for $1,200, it's very unlikely somebody who doesn't know who you are, you don't have a huge track record yet, is going to just check out without even speaking to you first or somebody on your team. So set up that strategy call. How I paint it is, hey, I, I don't accept everyone. This is a one-on-one -on -one thing. I want to make sure it's a good fit before I, I take your money. You know, I want to make sure it's right for you. So people are usually like, yeah, that, that, that's actually a good mindset. So um, yeah, an initial 45 minute discovery call where you dig into their pain points, figure out where they're at, where they want to go, figure out if it's a good fit. And then you can kind of make the, make the soft set sale there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, as somebody that does this, I have definitely met some people that I don't want to work with. So I'm really glad <laughs> that I had a call with them and I'm like, nope, not a good fit. Cause I do not want to take their money and then just be frustrated the whole time or just like dread getting on a call with them or whatever, you know? And so I think it's yeah. really important to, to have, you know, rules within yourself of like, yes, I want to make money, but like, I'm not going to make it at all costs. Right. Especially if you're talking about like, if you're starting to have that money back guarantee, a lot yeah. of vocal coaches that are just like, Hey, people are ready. You know, maybe they're big on TikTok, for instance. They're ready. They would pay you without speaking to you, but they can't match pitch. That's How are you going to help them through this problem that they want if they can't even do the basic thing of singing? So it's like having that first call and be like, okay, sing this song. Let's see if you're on, on par with where I want you to be as, as a student. Um, really, really helps. Yeah, that's a good point. They got to at least have kind of a basic level in order to. For, for you to be able to be successful with them. And, and ultimately that's what we want as coaches. Like we really do want to help people. That's why, of course we want to make money doing it. Yeah. Um, but we want to help people and we want them to succeed and they need to have at least, I think the basic tools in their tool belt in order to do that. And then we help them learn how to use those tools. Absolutely. For sure. Cool. Well, this has been a really cool conversation and we do a lot of the same things. So I think it's been interesting to kind of explore these, um, these ideas. I like to, I like to ask the questions as if like, I don't have my own opinion, <laughs> so I can <laughs> let you have your opinion. And then most of the time we pretty much agree. So, um, you know, I think we've kind of come up in the same schools of marketing and business and, and stuff like that, as far as like learning things online and, um, so let them know, like, how can they get in touch with you? How can they find you on social media? All the things. Sure. Um, I am most active on Instagram. You can find me at AC underscore Evan. The AC stands for artist collective. And if you're interested, you can go there. I've got a link in the bio that you can, again, book a strategy call, chat with me and my team, see if it's a good fit. Um, but I, you know, encourage you to check out the content, you know, see if it's something that makes sense. We are in one-on-one -on -one coaching. You you've got you want to work with somebody that you enjoy their energy, for the lack of a better term. So go check out my content. See if it's something that um, you want to explore a little bit more and reach out if it's something that makes sense. Definitely looking for creatives that are ready to be that artistpreneur and build their business. Yeah, I think that's what's great about podcasts that you can get a taste of like, do I like this person's energy? Do I feel like we would you know, really vibe and stuff, um, mm -hmm. on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So, um, anyone that's listening or watching, like you get a sense of what it would be like to work with Evan or myself or whatever by watching and listening to podcasts. I think it's just kind of like a window into like the personality of the person. So that's yeah, really that. cool. Cause you can, you can learn from the content, you can watch people on videos, but I think it's even a little different when you have like a, a you know, a long form conversation with a person. Yeah, unscripted. You yes, don't, don't unscripted. know. If there's yeah, there's no script in, in here. Yeah. He had no idea what I was going to ask him. So <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. always that's that's why I love doing podcasts. It's super fun for me. Just like to ask stuff and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like those are the best podcasts, and those are the best yeah. podcast hosts that are just like not out of uh, not in it for like the selfish reasons. You just seem to you want to talk to people. You want to kind of get to know people. So I think that's great. It comes off well. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing today, Evan. We really appreciate it. And I encourage all of our listeners to check you out. Cool. Thanks for having me. 
Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.